Give it up for Pastor Matt Ruckel. He's going to be taking us to the next step. All right. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be in verse 33 starting out. And we're in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the uh, Sermon Summer on the Mount sermon series. So this is week four, and everything I'm saying is going to connect back to the previous couple weeks. So Ian did a great job introing us. We jumped into the Beatitudes, and now we're in six cases that Jesus is showing us, looking back at the Torah in the Old Testament. He's looking at these laws. There are 613 laws in the Torah, the Old Testament, and Jesus is teaching us right now, how do we live in this new reality of the new covenant through the life of Jesus, the model of Jesus, so that we can be a blessed people, a flourishing people. Who here wants to flourish in the Lord? Okay, we're going to learn how to do that today. So, don't you love, um, anybody here love music? I know a lot of us do. Don't you love when you get the story behind the song, like a YouTube short, and they like tell all the details of how they wrote the song? And when you hear it from the author, it's the definitive explanation of what the truth of the song actually is. What we're getting right now through Jesus is the definitive truth of why these laws were created and what his heart behind them are. Jesus is the author. He is the truth. So we can trust what he's saying and what he's revealing to us in these cases so that we can reveal a life that reflects the heart and the kingdom of God. So this is incredibly exciting to, to get in step with what, what Jesus is doing. He wants to set the record straight. So he didn't come to abolish the laws. That's what Ian preached about last week. So Jesus isn't saying, I'm coming to do a whole new thing and I'm gonna abolish these. He said, I have come to fulfill these laws. So the religious people of the day were getting really nervous. They think this wild uh, false teacher is coming in to remove and destroy everything that God has built up to this point. Jesus is saying, I'm come to abolish it, but I'm coming to fulfill it and I'm coming to complete it. And we're gonna look at how Jesus goes beyond the outward and he always goes to the root issue, to the heart of it. So let's jump in this together. We're gonna read it first. So Matthew 5, starting in verse 33. I'm in the NIV this morning. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Anybody getting some grays here, struggling with this right now? Got a few coming in. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. So we see in this section that Jesus brings up three cases, and in each case, he gives three different analogies. And Jesus is using a tactic called hyperbole. It's exaggerating something to bring the point across so that you have to look in your own heart and really unpack this beyond the surface level, and what's deeper. Ian did a great job of this last week, preaching about if you sin, cut your eye out. Do we have an eye removal process here at Big House Church? No, of course not. He's not really asking us to cut our eyes out, but he's saying, take this so seriously on the inner level. Ian used a great analogy of 
somebody in the internship that was using their phone to not look at good stuff. And so he had to cut that off and he had to get a flip phone. The inner workings of this are take this so seriously, this Jesus walk, this being like Jesus, that if something's getting in the way, that you do everything in your power to remove it. Anybody had to remove some things in your life? Here's the thing, you might have to remove some things that are gray zone that might be okay for one person and not for another person. But if God's telling you to do it, then remove that thing. Because what might be okay for me might not be okay for you and vice versa. We have to use wisdom as we're unpacking this. There's gonna be a lot of localized, very specific analogies used in that day. And we're gonna have to translate these beautiful case studies to our lives right here, right now in 2024. And I'm so excited. I got a lot of research, a lot of quotes I want to give. So I'm going to move fast. You guys ready to stay with me this morning? Okay. Matthew 5, verse 33. Let's look at oaths. What is Jesus really talking about when he talks about oaths? So he's looking back at three different verses in the Old Testament. I think it's good for us to get the context of what these are saying and then how the Israelites started to use these oaths in a not very good way. And Jesus is addressing this right now. Leviticus 19, 12, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Numbers 30, it lists a bunch of different uh, vows that you could make, marriage vows, promises you could make. If someone makes a vow, he should do everything he has said that he would do. Deuteronomy 23, 21, when you make a vow, don't delay in fulfilling it. Jesus is getting to the heart of oaths and promises. He's saying, you're making promises with your words, but your actions aren't lining up. So stop it. Just be trustworthy and treat people rightly. There's a a persuasive human condition to try to manipulate people with our words. So we see the Israelites this time, if if anything that you did was really connected to an oath and say, I promise on the temple, or I promise on the gold in the temple. And The Israelites at that time held God in the name Yahweh so sacredly that they wouldn't actually say Yahweh. They might say the name Adonai, or there was an acronym used for for his name, but they were using God-adjacent symbols on behalf of God to try to prove that they would do what they said they were going to do. You maybe heard it said this way in our time, I swear on the grave of my mother, I swear on my firstborn. What are you trying to say? I'm taking this really seriously. But at the end of the day, should you have to swear on anything if your word is good? No, you shouldn't have to. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Do the right thing at the right time. So let's go to verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you make. So quick pause here, a little, little cultural context. When Jesus says, again, You've heard that it was said, he's reaching back to these laws. So in the Torah, there's 613 laws, including the 10 commandments. And Jesus is helping them sort out what is the root meaning behind these laws. So when he says this idea, everyone's like, okay, we know exactly what you're saying, Jesus. So again, when you've heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. So in this first case of oaths, we see this first section that Jesus brings up in verse 34. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So let's get some context further on in the book of Matthew in chapter 23 to see what this is really talking about. So Jesus shares these eight woes. These are these rebukes that he's giving to the leaders at the time, and it helps us understand a little bit more what was taking place. He says, woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. This is what people do. 
can I borrow your donkey? No. I swear on the, the gold in the temple. Okay. He gets back. Where's the donkey? Uh, it's going to be late. But I didn't swear like on the temple, you know, or the gold of the temple. It's just, I just, just, I just use a little subversive way to manipulate you into saying yes, even though I knew that my word wasn't good. When trust is broken, when promises are broken, the life-giving, flourishing, wonderful uh, kingdom of God does not flow through us. Are you with us this morning? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Be someone where your word uh, means something. Verse two, and uh, verse, verse 36, second of this first case. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. I think what Jesus is trying to say here, don't even swear on your own head. Everything is holy. How many of you know that in him we live, we move, we breathe, we have our being, he holds everything together. He is the creator of the universe. All things are unto him and holy unto him even your own head, value it as a child of God and don't use it as a way to manipulate somebody into getting what you want in a false promise. The last one is this. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So what do we see in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter three with Eve? We see the serpent come in and what does he do? He just tweaks that just a little bit. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? When we bring manipulation into our conversations to try to get what we want and subversively move something to our own decisions, we begin to partner with the evil one. And that's why Jesus says, don't do that. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. And we really see the fullness of this in James chapter four, verse 13 through 17. I love this. It's going to wrap it up in a bow. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is for them sin. We don't even know what tomorrow may hold. Be really careful with your plans and your words and the things that you promise. Anybody got kids in the room? You learn this. You be careful with what you promise to your kids, right? They'll forget 30 seconds later that you just asked them to unload the dishwasher. But if you promise to take them to the Bush Garden seven years ago, they will remind you every day after day. So they'll, they'll, they'll corner you and say, Dad, will you promise we're going to go to Pizza Hut today? And I'll say, I'd love to go to Pizza Hut. That's my hope and my plan. I cannot promise that. But if the Lord wills it, we're just a vapor. Anything could happen tomorrow. I can't promise anything. Just just be careful. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. But if you say, hey, we're going to do this, then come through on it so your kids can trust you. Now, what's the danger in today's culture with this God manipulation? Well, it's really easy for one person to say one statement that trumps everything from this point forward. Well, God told me and I'm doing it, whether you like it or not. Can I bring some context to that a little bit? So 2016, 2017, Christy and I are in a place of what I would call divine discontent. The Lord's kind of bring in this, this sandpaper to us and we're praying and asking God, what are you calling us to do? To stay, to go, what is the next, what is the next plan here? So I go to Hampton Roads to a conference and the Lord speaks to me so clearly on my own. So I call Christy and I say, You'll never, you're never gonna believe this, but I'm feeling like God's calling us back to Virginia. Husbands, how many of you know that you gotta ease your wives into things sometimes? <laughs> so I wasn't saying, thus saith the Lord, we're doing this. I said, I'm submitting this to you to pray about, to process, because I don't wanna manipulate you with my words. It would've been really easy for me to say, God's made this crystal clear, start packing your bags. 
I realized I had a lot of submitting along the way through wise counsel and through family on what was next. So I bought a house, Christy and I did, with Christy's parents, Kay and Dave. So they, they come to church, they hear first service. And so I knew that I needed to submit this to them. So when I got back, we sat down at the kitchen table with Kay and Dave, and I said, I want to share something with you guys. And Kay said, you don't have to say anything. She started crying. She said, if the Lord's calling us to move, we're ready. So God has gone ahead and confirmed this to another person. Then I realized I'm an active member at a, at a local church in Florida. And I realized I need to submit this to my pastor. So I planned a meeting, sat with him, and I explained the situation. He said, are you telling me you're leaving? I said, I'm not telling you anything. I'm not demanding or declaring anything. I submitted that decision to my pastor to pray about. You see how this, how this non-manipulation works along the way? I'm still prophetically motivated. I am still sold out on radical obedience. When the Lord says it, he will do it, but it still takes wise counsel and it still takes a process of submitting this to other people. I hear a lot of people hear from the Lord on a right decision and they do it at the wrong time and they don't do it under submission and they don't fully receive the blessing that God wants to send them with. When I submitted this to my pastor, he took two days and prayed about it and he said, I've heard from the Lord and and I want, to, I want to release you. And I was released with a blessing. And so that's what we want for you. No one here at Big House wants to manipulate or be controlling over your life. We, we just want to love you, partner with you, and make sure you're hearing from the Lord together. Sometimes you need to slow down a little bit. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Jacob so wonderfully said this in a meeting last week. You've heard the phrase, God's will and his way. Jacob's like, and your when. That's so good. Your will, your way, and when do you want me to do this? And how can I stay in step with you? So we're in this first case of oath making and making sure we're not using our words and spiritual manipulation to get what we want with others or in the promises that we make. I wanna read from Jonathan Pennington, who Ian and I have both referenced. He wrote a great book called The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. You should get it. It's so good. He says this. As with other critical explanation and interpretation of this text, Jesus is not overturning or abolishing the original commandment. He's not opposed uh, to oath or vow taking. There's, There's some religions that literally don't go into political office because they say, oh, I can't take an oath. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Uh, He would certainly affirm the importance of following through with integrity on what one vows to do in accordance with several Old Testament texts. Instead, using exaggerated language, poetic speech, Jesus is speaking to the heart issue of trying to get out of fulfilling one's vows by semantic and technical arguments about the supposed differences between the objects upon which one bases their vows. If one is going to do this, he or she should not make any vows at all. With strong and persuasive images, Jesus shows that this way of practicing vows is not the way of being in the world that accords with God's nature, will, and coming kingdom. This is not a righteousness greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. So as we close this first case, this is what I want you to understand. This is Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount calling the crowd into discipleship and saying, if you want to follow me, if you want to do what I do and bring the kingdom, this is the way that we're going to do it. The promises that we make, we're going to make good on them and we're not going to manipulate anyone in what we're trying to get. You with me this morning? Okay. An eye for an eye. Let's go to the second case. Matthew 5 verse 38. This can sound really brutal, can't it? This one's tough. I had to really look into this. Really, its purpose was to counter an impulse for revenge. Think about Hatsfields and McCoys, right? You hurt me, I hurt you, I take this, I take this, and it just, it just builds and builds and builds. Have you ever seen this on the street? Somebody bumps into somebody else. Hey, man, what do you think you're doing? You know, he pushes him, he pushes the other guy, it escalates, he throws a punch, they're rolling on the ground, and then somebody's like, I'm gonna kill you. Humans are terrible. 
at justice and retribution and having a ceiling on what's right and wrong. We will just let it boil over. So this was actually a law of grace to say, there is going to be a right cap on what should be done. And so if you hurt this person they hurt the, 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 in kind, but no more is what's gonna happen. If you borrowed a donkey and it dies, then you gotta bring that donkey back. That's what's fair. So this is about justice, not vengeance. So verse 38, let's look into it. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. I picked on Ian last time. So Adam, you ready? Come on up here, sit across from me. Get up for Adam, our best and favorite youth pastor, father of John Luke. Okay, so think about this. In this time, the right hand is the dominant hand that you would use. But where's your right cheek? That side. So how do I get there? Backhanded slap, right? If I get the other cheek, it's open-handed, right? Give it up for Adam. Great job. You nailed it, Adam. That was, wow. Wow. I know I can trust you with any. So a backhanded blow to the right cheek does not suppose shattered teeth as in, a, as in a fight. It was an insult, the most severe public affront to a person's dignity. There's actually recourse for this offense to backhanded slap somebody. It also showed that I have authority over you and I can prove to you that I'm bigger, stronger, and better than you. So, an open-handed slap with the open right hand was a sign of equals in combat together. So, imagine like two generals, same rank, in conflict together. It would be an open-handed slap. But backhanded slap was this literal public affront to a person's dignity. So, one interesting take on this, this passage is about non-violent... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Nonviolent. I can't, it's just gone. Recourse, yeah. Thank you. Lucy is going to take over for me at this point. <laughs> it's nonviolent recourse. It's to, it's to stand for justice and righteousness, but to do it in a way that reveals the person's heart. So getting slapped with the backhand, but standing there and taking it and saying, would you like to treat me as a human, as an equal, and slap me with the open hand? It's saying, you're treating me like a lesser, like an animal, but I'm human, and even in this broken structure of socioeconomics or uh, with just the day and time with, with Romans versus Israelites, it was saying, I'm human, and I want you to think about your actions from an internal level but I'm not gonna take recourse in a way that's, that's, that's gonna be physical back to you, but I'm gonna make you think about this. Nonviolent protest was the word I wanted. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says this. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. For most of us, uh, much of this verse will look like being gracious to the person that has offended you or abused you or hurt you. It's not to say that you're gonna be a doormat for the rest of your life and someone can continue to abuse you. That's not the context here. Everyone with me on that? So let's go to the second section of this second case. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. So there's a law in this time that if you've lost basically have no uh, property of your own, uh, but somebody wants to sue you, they can take your outer coat, but they have to give it back to you by nightfall because it's cold in Jerusalem through most of the year. And so you have to give it back to that person, but it's this promise. But your shirt, tunic, is the thing that rests against your skin. So if somebody says, I'm suing you for your shirt. What they're saying is it's an absurd and unreasonable and unlawful request to try to demean you. And so what it says is if they want your shirt also, give them your coat too because it's gonna hold them accountable to the ruthless decision that they're making. It's, 
a nonviolent protest. It's standing against injustice, standing against in a way that's actually, um, uh, in a way, nonviolent. But it's revealing to that person the heart of the issue. Third one is this. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So in this time, Roman soldiers could connect with anyone, could grab anyone, uh, anyone Jewish and say, carry my bag and my stuff for one mile. This was a degrading act, right? An incredibly you could be on vacation or, or cooking dinner and then you get pulled away to walk with this soldier one mile. So that's, that's taking from you. That's demeaning. But imagine what happens after that first mile is crossed and you say, can I carry your bags another mile? Look at the heart that is shifted in that moment. What do you mean another mile? You don't have to do another mile. No, I want to do another mile. Tell me about your wife. Tell me about your kids. How's your troop doing? You know? Tell me about those shoes, you know? Explain the Romans road to me, you know? Where are you heading next? <laughs> the Romans road, that's funny, I didn't mean to. But it's, it reveals to that heart of this person, I'm gonna go above and beyond to reveal Christ to you. That begins to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. When someone's wrong to you and you say, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go after you, I'm not after recourse, I'm just gonna forgive. Man, it's like putting coals on their head, right? We see this in Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so here we are in the second case. We're looking at eye for an eye, and Jesus is teaching the Israelites, teaching the disciples of God how to go the extra mile and reveal the heart of God to those who are taking advantage of them. The first section was this. Hey, there's a conflict. What do we do with this? The second one is someone is oppressing me and, and, and trying to take advantage of me. And then we're gonna move on the third one to what happens when someone hates you. Before we get there, I've got two powerful quotes that I think are gonna sum this up for us. Again, Jonathan uh, Pennington says this, it's important to note that this point, that as with all ethical teaching and practical working out of these principles, even these specific illustrations of cheek turning, coat giving, and mile walking require localized wisdom. Hear me on this, this is important. Without neutering the challenge of this virtue vision, we must acknowledge that these illustrations are just that. They are not to be applied literally and without wise exceptions. The command to turn the other cheek does not apply to the situation of rescuing a child from abuse, nor does the example of giving to those who beg or require me to hand over the keys to my car to a homeless man who approaches me in the grocery store parking lot. Can I hear an amen on that? This kind of literalistic interpretation not only misses the point of this interpretation, but also misunderstands the nature of this advice given. It gives a vision of virtue, of how to be in the world that accords with God's righteousness. But the working out of this in the individual's life is inevitably localized. This is wisdom. Jesus is teaching through a localized situation a thousand years ago how we can apply this to our lives right now, and it requires wisdom. Can I hear an amen on that? Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. so wisely shared on this very topic. He said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. It's a weapon unique in history, which, which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields it. It is a sword that heals. Why should we love our enemies? Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. 
adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, he is setting forth a profound and ultimately inescapable abomination. Have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? The chain reaction of evil. Hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken, or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. Hate multiplies hate. Only love can make a way. You guys agree with that? This is what Jesus is offering to us and inviting us into. All right, last one. This is case number three. We're almost there. This is love your enemies. This will connect back to the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? Who is our neighbor? Who are the people around us? I'd like to make the case that everyone is beloved of God and are future friends of ours. So often as a pastor, you, you, can, you can meet an abrasive person and it's easy to sell them off, sell them short, or not want to deal with them. But I found it as you take time to get to know somebody and you begin to hear your story, grace begins to get poured out for that person. Your life is not the same story as somebody else's. Somebody might have gone through something very difficult. They might be have massive physical pain in their body right now and they've been suffering for 10 years and you have no idea. So what you can handle really easily is really hard for them. So when you know that about them and take enough time to get to know them, you have an extra special grace for them. Instead of getting frustrated with them, it's like, it's a hug and be like, how are you doing? Hey, you doing okay? What can I do for you? They might've gone through some really challenging abuse or maybe a divorce. And so it takes sensitivity and learning how to talk to them and deal with them. What Jesus is calling us into is being sensitive to those around us so that the love of Jesus can flow and that his kingdom can come through us. We are his hands and his feet, right? So we wanna operate in a way that reflects and looks like Jesus. Okay, so now this one's tough, okay? So it's not just a disagreement. This is how do I respond when somebody hates me? Verse 40, uh, 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So the first of this sixth case. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unjust. There's a common grace that God pours out to us. It doesn't just, if my neighbor's unsaved, it's not like my garden's gonna grow and it only rains in my yard and not on their yard. <laughs> God's pouring out his love and grace to all creation. He wishes that none would perish. And it's important for us to step into the revelation that God's extravagant love is for everyone. He wants everyone to see his goodness and blessing. Don't treat everyone like an enemy. See them as a future friend. Think about this, Jesus and his apostles, and his impossibles. Jesus and his apostles. Cool name, you know? Jesus and the apostles. Um, they never look at another human as the enemy. See, David in the Psalms, he's literally got maybe a, a wicked kingdom physically trying to kill them right now. In the New Testament, in this new covenant, we see that what's happening is that really they're against the demonic powers and principalities that take our mind captive to think we're each other's enemies. Man, can I tell you, I have seen the power of forgiveness in my life people that have hated each other or a situation that feels so impossible that when people will sit down together, really hear each other and say, I forgive, man, it melts like wax, doesn't it? Forgiveness is this powerful ability we have to say, I'm letting you off the hook. And we can do that. You know why? Because Jesus let us off the hook. And it's important for us to live in that way. Does that mean we get taken advantage of and we, and we get stuck in, a, in an abusive situation? No, 
that's why we need wisdom. That's why we need wise counsel. And that's why we need to hear from the voice of the Lord in every situation. Okay. Uh, Second section of this last one is, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Jesus says, if you're just being nice to your own family, your own crew, all you get is a C plus. Even the pagans are doing that. You have to go above and beyond to welcome Jesus in. When you pull somebody in from a, a maybe different situation or background or ethnicity, it, it, it begins to invite Jesus into those situations. And um, I think every day, all the time, there's an important way for us to invite people that might be on the outside to the inside. You guys with me on that? Very simple but important lesson I learned. I was at college. Christy had a friend, call her Jill. I just thought Jill did not like me. We just didn't get along. Like, I just saw her and was like, ignored her. And she talked, to, and I was like, what's up with Jill? And Christy's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I, she's, I don't know why she doesn't like me. And she's like, well, let me ask her. I was like, okay, fine. And she's like, I thought Matt didn't like me. I'm like, that's crazy, you know? So like, we saw each other the next day. I was like, I was like so I heard you don't like me. You, you, you're, I heard, heard like, nothing's wrong with us. And she's like, yeah, it's great. Like, we just instantly were friends because there's this ridiculous misconception we have between each other. How simple it is for us to, to, to just be loving. And then I've also had to learn how to project myself in a way that invites people in that I like them and I'm glad you're here. Do you know you can see a smile from 70 yards away? Everyone smile real big. Oh, you're not smiling. I see you right there. There you are. I see these smiles. It's contagious, isn't it? You're like 90% more likely to be approached at an event if you're smiling and you have an open posture. So if you're just grumping all the time, you might need to work on that to, to be more approachable. Hey, just helping you out. I'm just doing what I can here. Last one coming in for a landing here. This is the big one, and there's a lot to this, and I want to walk in this very, very carefully, and I want to give a lot of context, and I want to allow you to begin to process this next verse because it has a lot of the- theological implications, but I want, to, I want to share some viewpoints that I've seen. Take it back to the Greek, process it a little bit. Verse 3, uh, verse 48. Sorry, last section in this sixth case. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Woo, right? That's a lot. There's a lot to that. It's wonderful. It's a little bit awe and wonder. It's a little fear and trembling, right? But it's good. Now, he's wrapping up in the book of Matthew, Jesus is wrapping up this whole six case section. He's saying, I want to invite you into the flourishing life of what it looks like to be a disciple so that you can follow in the way of Jesus. Don't get stuck on this word perfect. Get stuck on what it means to follow Jesus, to obey him, to run your race with passion and with focus, to give God your every day, to be sold out to him in consecration. We are justified upon salvation. I've heard it said, it's just as if I'd never sinned. You are justified through Christ Jesus. You are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus upon that moment of salvation. And then there's the sanctification process, daily turning to God. If you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive, right? I think of maybe a cheesy, maybe a bad analogy, but I think sanctification, a little bit like sanitization, right? You got, think about your, your, your kitchen table, you know? It's like, man, ours gets messy in 30 minutes. We got, you know, 100 people living in our house, you know? But it takes this constant process. And so I'm always looking at my heart. My pastor growing up said, keep a short record of sins, you know? So I never want to go uh, in, a, in a way that dishonors the Lord, Another example, a couple things to think through. Well, let me, let me pause on that. I'll tell that story in a second. So this word perfect is teleos. And there, I mean, we could talk about this for the next six months on all, all the research done on this word teleos. But in the Bible, it's used many different ways. Perfect, mature, complete, fully developed, or whole. So some uh, 
Jonathan Pennington would, would, would say this, therefore you should be whole as your heavenly father is whole. So here's the heart of this. We want to look like Jesus. Mold me, shape me. We're being transformed into the image of Christ. Every, if I get a little off, I'm just back into the waffle maker of Jesus, you know, like being formed into his image. I want to look like him. So this frees us into looking like Jesus and to position ourselves for holiness. I want to be holy as he is holy. So a group of us in college meeting with a mentor, somebody says, well, everybody struggles with lust. You know, and a bunch of 18-year-old guys are like, yeah, of course, you know. And the, the mentor's like, no, that's an ungodly belief. Did you know you can overcome lust? Did you know that you don't have to be ruled by the flesh anymore? I mean, there's this shift that took place. I don't have to be trapped any longer. So it's freeing us from this like, well, I'll never be perfect, so whatever, you know, I can just throw this away. It's like, no, you can continue in righteousness and holiness. Let's pursue that at the highest level. Now, pastorally, there was a different situation with somebody else I was pastoring. They grew up and the belief was that if, if they listened to secular music and they were on the way home and they died in a car accident, they would go to hell. So on the other side, there's this religiosity that says like, well, if you're not perfect, then you're not good enough and you're out of here. And it creates this sense of worrying about your salvation. Does Jesus want you worrying about your eternal security? No, but there is a balance here. Are you guys with me on that? Let's pursue Jesus. Let's create an environment where people experience Jesus through us. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. I want to close with this verse. Let's stand together. 1 John 3, 2 says this, dear friends, now we are children of God. Everyone say, I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. There's some mystery in this Jesus walk, isn't there? You can't, you, you, you got to hold a little bit of mystery, you guys, in this. But continuing to pursue Jesus with everything that we have. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus, we want to see you like you really are. Jesus, we want to honor you. We recognize that our bodies are a temple bought and paid for. Holy Spirit living inside of us. Lord, we just thank you for a breaking down of, of lives that are untruths that have tried to keep us trapped in our sin and in our brokenness. I thank you for deeper levels, holiness, righteousness, and purification so that we can be perfect like you are perfect, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, that your blood covers us.